President Biden reiterated the country's commitment to Taiwan, defending the island amidst attack from China. But are there any changes in U.S. strategy? A new economic strategy for allies in and around Asia is being formed under U.S. leadership. But is China invited? Is Taiwan invited? And what is the most difficult part in the strategy? The NBA returns to China after a three-year ban. An investigation finds NBA team owners have billions of dollars of investments in China. And we sat down with John O'Neill and Sarah Wynn, authors of The Dancer and the Devil. They tell us how Communist China tried to stop their book from being published here in America. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. President Biden has condemned any possible attack on Taiwan from China. He says the U.S. is committed to standing with other nations and preventing possible strikes. But White House officials point out no changes have been made to U.S. policy surrounding the issue. NDD's Jeremy Sandberg brings us more. When President Biden was asked on Monday if he was willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan in the event of a possible attack, the president answered with a definitive, Yes. The president says it's the commitment that was made. The idea that that it can be taken by force, just taken by force, is just not, is just not appropriate. It will dislocate the entire region and be another action similar to what happened in, in, uh, in Ukraine. However, White House officials have pointed out after similar comments by the president in the past that no changes have been made to U.S. policy in the region. A lot of it depends upon just how strongly the world makes clear that that kind of action is going to result in long-term disapprobation by the rest of the community. The U.S. maintains a strategic ambiguity regarding military defense of Taiwan in the case of a Chinese attack. Biden criticized China and says his expectations are that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan will not happen or be attempted. They're already flirting with danger right now by flying so close and all the maneuvers they're undertaken. China's foreign ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin fired back on Biden's comments, saying China deplores and rejects the remarks from the U.S. Wang says the Taiwan issue is an internal affair with no room for compromise or concession, citing China's core interests on sovereignty and territorial integrity. The spokesperson urged the U.S. to abide by the One China Principle and warned against support of Taiwan's independence. The Chinese Communist Party's One China Principle is different from the One China policy abided to by the United States. The Chinese regime only recognizes its version, considering Taiwan part of its territory. While acknowledging China's stance, the U.S. does not recognize Taiwan as a part of China. U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price clarified the U.S. position in a Twitter post on Saturday. Price stated, China continues to publicly misrepresent U.S. policy and that the U.S. does not subscribe to the One China principle. Biden says the U.S. supports the One China policy but stands by past commitments. It does not mean that China has the ability, has the, excuse me, the, the jurisdiction to go in and use force to take over Taiwan. So we stand firmly with Japan and with other nations that, not to let that happen. Growing concerns about China have pushed Japan and other nations in the region to build up defensive capabilities. India, Korea and the Philippines are doing the same. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Trade talks halfway across the world could eventually impact your wallet here in the United States. President Biden just announced his Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Monday morning. It includes neither China nor Taiwan. NTD's Jessica Beatty has more. President Biden's in Tokyo launching a new Indo-Pacific Economic Framework as Washington tries to keep Beijing's influence in check. We share the same goal of ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific that will deliver greater prosperity and greater opportunity for all of our children. The framework has 13 members, including the United States. Together, they represent 40 percent of global gross domestic product. The new group does not include China or Taiwan. Ahead of the launch, China's foreign minister accused the U.S. of trying to contain Beijing. In response, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters that other countries can join in the future. 
He said the group is not a security arrangement. It'll mostly deal with economic policies. The group will focus on four main economic pillars, connecting economies, including digitally, supply chain resilience, renewable energy, and tax and anti-corruption. Ahead of the announcement, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai said trading partners in the region were enthusiastic. I don't think anybody's economy is stronger because of COVID, right? Um, and uh, there is um, a, a pretty pervasive sense of anxiety about um, uh, how we recover. I actually think that this presents us with an incredible opportunity. Back in 2017, the Trump administration pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Then China magnified its influence in the region with the largest trade bloc in history. Catherine Tai says the U.S. is focused on competition with China and bringing a market-based approach to the region. The United States will always bring an economic engagement that is grounded in our values. So uh, the engagement that we will bring um, by nature inherently will be different from China's engagement with the region. Seeking Alpha reports that the group is not a free trade deal. Instead, it's more of an economic arrangement. That means a lot of it likely won't have to go through Congress. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. One of the key areas of the new Indo-Pacific economic framework is renewable energy. China has been dominating the global solar panel market for a decade. Thanks to subsidies, the Chinese Communist Party gives Chinese manufacturers. Another aspect in energy sector is related to electric vehicles, and China is also dominant in part of the supply chain. It has to do with the Biden administration's urging to boost electric vehicle use. The plan looks to help achieve climate goals, but it may have an unintended consequence. On the flip side of lowering emissions, more electric cars on the road might deepen America's dependence on a certain Chinese supply chain. For the first time ever, production of electric vehicles or EVs used up more cobalt than smartphones and personal computers last year. Cobalt is a rare metal needed to make lithium-ion batteries. Data shows that EV production used nearly 60,000 tons of cobalt in 2021, 34% of all cobalt demand. Making mobile phones used around 15%, and personal computers totaled only 9%. Those numbers are a reflection of the growing EV market. A report from the International Energy Agency says EV sales doubled in 2021, from 4% in 2020 to 8.5% in the next year. The large use of cobalt highlights a big obstacle for the EV industry, sourcing enough material to make the batteries. Cobalt is a huge problem. Three quarters of it comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo where China and London dominate metals mining. The second largest cobalt supplier is Australia. But according to the Cobalt Institute, Australia provides only around 3% of the cobalt supply. NBA team owners have billions of dollars worth of personal investments in China. An investigation into those funds comes as NBA games quietly return to China's TV screens after a three-year ban. They were banned after one general manager spoke out against human rights abuses in Hong Kong. NTD's Colin Fredrickson has more. More information on the NBA's financial ties to China. 40 principal NBA team owners, as a group, have over $10 billion linked to China, according to the ESPN analysis. It concludes that their money would be at risk if they got on the wrong side of the Chinese regime. It's very simple. It comes down to, to money. Fred Rockefort is an attorney at Harris Bricken, which represents many companies that do business in China. Rockefort says companies like the NBA are essentially blinded by, by the money to such an extent that they're willing to overlook any other consideration. ESPN hired Strategy Risk, a firm that researches the risks of doing business in China, to look into the team owners. Strategy Risk says Miami Heat owner Mickey Arison has over $375 million tied to China, partially through his company Carnival Corp., the biggest cruise operator. Chinese nationals represented 8% of its passengers before the CCP virus hit. Memphis Grizzlies owner Robert Perra is both founder and majority shareholder of tech firm Ubiquity, which manufactures most of its products in China. 
China. Brooklyn Nets owner Joe Tsai has 53.5% of his net worth tied to China. Tsai is the executive vice chairman of Alibaba. Sacramento Kings owner Paul Jacobs has a big stake in Qualcomm, which earned two-thirds of its annual revenue in China last year. Jacobs used to be Qualcomm's CEO. Houston Rockets owner Tillman Fertitta is the president of Landry's, which operates 10 restaurants in China. Strategy Risks estimates his total exposure is $160.3 million. Philadelphia 76ers owner Joshua Harris co-founded and owns 20% of Apollo Global Management, which has three subsidiaries in Hong Kong and one in Shanghai. And of course, Charlotte Hornets owner Michael Jordan's brand, Air Jordan, is very big in China. The NBA has a hard decision to make. Bob Bilbrook is the CEO of Capture, as well as an avid basketball fan. Bilbrook says, You have to decide, you know, are we, an, are we a U.S. <laughs> American brand or are we a world brand and we're okay with, you know, the things that are going on. ESPN's analysis came out as NBA games have quietly returned to China's state-run TV on the eve of the NBA playoffs. Fredrickson, NTD News. The return came after a three-year ban. It began back in 2019 when Daryl Murray, the Houston Rockets general manager at the time, tweeted support for Hong Kong's pro-democracy protesters. And joining us now, John O'Neill and Sarah Wynn, authors of The Dancer and the Devil, a deep dive into the murders and bio war of Stalin, Putin and Xi Jinping. But it seems one country in particular tried to stop their book from seeing the light of day. John and Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Oh, it's wonderful Thanks to be on your us. show, Tiffany. Thank you. So both of you newly released a book, right, called The Dancer and the Devil, and it traces the history of kind of mass executions and personal assassinations that happened under Stalin, but also we're seeing that now under Putin and Xi. And as you were writing this book, you kind of ran into some pushback. So tell us about that. We first received pushback when we were trying to get the book published. We had interest from several publishing houses in New York, but they said we love the portion of the book if you take Xi and Putin out. We just want to hear about Stalin and Pavlova. And of course, at that point, COVID-19 had happened and we viewed Putin and Xi as integral parts of this story that takes place over a century. And so we moved on and went with another publishing house, Regnery. But that was our first pushback. Then um, the first thing I noticed was the weekend of May the 8th of last year, um, I opened the website, I mean, opened our manuscript to work on it and it had been opened at 4 a.m. that day. Well, I'm the only one that had access to the manuscript. John didn't even have access. And so we could tell that someone had been on, seen the manuscript, um, looking for our sources, saw the sources that we documented in the book. Fortunately, the secret sources that we were trying to protect, we didn't have in the cloud. So that was a good thing. But at that point, we were nervous and we called the FBI. They suggested that we get a computer forensic expert involved, which we did. I turned over my hard drive. He made copies of that. We gave him passwords to my Wi-Fi, et cetera. And we, have a, we got a written report from the forensics expert. His conclusion was that it was in fact in the cloud, that the, the stuff was all destroyed in the cloud. Because it was destroyed in the cloud, it was not traceable. He, he concluded, however, that in the world, there's only one group of people that own the cloud like this. This is the Apple cloud. And that group of people is the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. Very same people that have been hitting Sarah's website. We were told actually by the computer expert, the Chinese own the cloud. Attempt at suppression has continued. So our book was released on April the 26th and um, we've been on several different media programs and saw it rise on Amazon, but no one was able to leave a review. They couldn't leave reviews and, and we would get screenshots from people who said, I'm trying to leave a review. And I've been told due to the content of this review, it's being monitored. Only verified purchasers can leave reviews. These were verified mm -hmm. purchasers sending us this. It's got to be the only book that for a time was number 17 of all the sales of Amazon that had no reviews uh, of any kind. That's I thought it was just taking a long time to read the book. I had no idea. We then started looking into it and there is a Reuters report also in other news agencies and the Chinese government following criticism of a biography of Xi Jinping reached an agreement with Amazon that any remarks that were uh, critical of Xi Jinping and reviews would be. would be deleted. And so our book is, we're not fans of Xi by a long shot. And so the reviews of our book for a time, it simply would not allow any reviews on Amazon.
Now they're now allowing some reviews since we complained on Amazon. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Here's what's coming in our second half. We hear more from John O'Neill and Sarah Wynn, authors of The Dancer and the Devil. They expose just how far the Communist Party's tentacles reach. And the U.S.'s top defense official addresses cadets graduating from West Point. In a speech, he urged them to prepare for future wars between superpowers, especially Russia and China. Our full episode can be watched on our partner platform, Adblock TV. To sign up for a free 14-day trial, please click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you tomorrow. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held from September 29th to October 2nd at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com.